Hello, good evening, Tashiv. Smashida Vishdirst. This is school tradition to me as Conti Aron. Welcome to lesson three of my free traditional singing course sponsored by Gasyard Fila. This song is called The Bird's Keely and it's one that I wrote myself and it's a bit of a fast pace one and it has a Gaelic Lilton chorus to it. So hopefully you enjoy it. The blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush, they all got together to have a keely in the bush singing. Hindro harahu he, hindro lara, hindro harahu, ruri, ruri, hindro harahu he, hindro lara. Said the robin to the wren, if you will dance with me, we'll join our feet together in a mirth and harmony singing. Hindro harahu he, hindro lara, hindro harahu, ruri. Rudy, Hendro, Harahu, he, and Ulala. Well, the blackbird puffed his chest, said, There's no finer voice than mine, as he danced and hopped about from a twig to branch to vine singing. Hendro, Harahu, he, and Ulala. Hendro, Harahu, Rudy, Rudy, Hendro, Harahu, he, and Ulala. Well, the larky came along and said, I think that you'll find, sir, that my voice alone can make a bigger stir singing. Hendro, harahu, he, and ulala. Hendro, harahu, ruri, ruri. Hendro, harahu, he, and ulala. Oh, the blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush, they all got together to have a keely in the bush singing. Hendro, harahu, he, and ulala. Hendro, harahu, ruri. Ruri, Hendro, Harahu, He, Hendro, Lala. So we're just going to break this down the same way that we broke down the Creel song. We'll take the first section, then go try out the chorus, and then go on to the next section, try out the chorus a couple of times, and just go from there. I'll sing the first part, and then sing it through a couple of times, and I want you to sing through it with me, but I'll give you a heads up. The blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush They all met together to have the keely in the bush So sing that with me The blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush They all met together to have the keely in the bush And one more time the blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush, they all met together to have the keely in the bush. And then we'll go on to the chorus. Singing, Hendro Harahu he, Hendro Lala. So we'll break that into two separate parts. So I want you to sing that with me. Singing, Hendro Harahu he, Hendro Lala. Singing, Hendro Harahu he, and la la one more time singing hendro harahu hi and la la and then the next part is hiruri hiruri so that's a bit more complicated we've got hiruri hiruri i'll put that up on the screen for you so you know what it is that my mouth's doing because it's a bit confusing hiruri are you i father Hiru ri, hiru ri, and you would roll the R, so it's hiru ri, hiru ri. So we've got hendro harahu hi, hendo la la, hendro harahu ri ri, ri ri, hendro harahu hi, hendo la la. We've got the same first part and last part, just a wee bit of a different part in the middle. We'll take it up a pitch just because it's maybe a bit low. Singing, Hendro Harahu he, Hendro Lala. And again, Hendro Harahu he, Hendro Lala. One more time. Singing, Hendro Harahu he, Hendro Lala. And then we've got our wee confusing bit. Hiruri, Hiruri. And sing it with me. Hiruri, Hiruri. And one more time. Hiruri, Hiruri. And then put that together. Singing, Hendro Harahu, he, Hendo Lala. Hendro Harahu, Ruri, Ruri. So sing that with me. Singing, Hendro Harahu, he, Hendo Lala. Hendro Harahu, 
Hirri, Hirri, singing Hendru Harahu, he, Hendu Lala, Hendru Harahu, Hirri, Hirri, and then add on the tail bit, singing Hendru Harahu, he, Hendu Lala, Hendru Harahu, Hirri, Hirri, Hendru Harahu, he, Hendu Lala. Very good. So we'll get a bit more practice at that as the next part. So the next part is Say the robin to the wren if you will dance with me. Sing that with me. Say the robin to the wren if you will dance with me. One more time. Say the robin to the wren if you will dance with me. We'll join our feet together in a mirth and harmony. And with me. We'll join our feet together in a mirth and harmony. One more time. We'll join our feet together in a mirth and harmony. And all together. Said the robin to the wren, if you will dance with me, we'll join our feet together in a mirth and harmony. Singing, Hendru Harahu hi, Hendu Lala, Hendru Harahu, Hiruri, Hiruri, Hendru Harahu hi, Hendu Lala. This is a short enough song that we'll be able to go through the whole thing. Next part is Well the blackbird puffed his chest said there's no finer voice than mine. Sing that with me. Well the blackbird puffed his chest said there's no finer voice than mine. And one more time. Well the blackbird puffed his chest said there's no finer voice than mine. As he danced and hopped about from twig to branch to vine. And sing that with me. As he danced and hopped about from twig to branch to vine. One more time. As he danced and hopped about from twig to branch to vine. And all together with the chorus. Well, the blackbird puffed his chest, said there's no finer voice than mine. As he danced and hopped about from twig to branch to vine. Singing Hendro Harahu he, Hendro Lala. Hendro Harahu. Hiruri, hiruri, hendro harahu hi, hendro la la. Next part, second to last verse, we're flying through it. It's really quite simple song. Well, the larky came along and said, I think that you'll find, sir. Sing that with me. Well, the larky came along and said, I think that you'll find, sir. There's a lot of words in that, so we'll sing it again. Well, the larky came along and said, I think that you'll find, sir. And one more time. Well, the larky came along and said, I think that you'll find, sir. The next part. That my voice alone can make a bigger stir. And all together with me. That my voice alone can make a bigger stir. One more time. That my voice alone can make a bigger stir. And all that together with the chorus. Well, the larky came along and said, I think that you'll find, sir, that my voice alone can make a bigger stir. Singing, Hendru Harahu, he, Hendu Lala, Hendru Harahu, Ruri, Ruri, Hendru Harahu, he, Hendu Lala. And then the very last part's just a repetition of the first part. So it's the blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush. They all met together to have the keely in the bush. So sing that with me. The blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush. They all met together to have the keely in the bush. And all together with the chorus. The blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush, they all met together to have the keely in the bush. Singing, Hendru Harahu, he, Hendu Lala, Hendru Harahu, Ruri, Ruri, Hendru Harahu, he, Hendu Lala. Great job, so we've went through the entire song, and it's a really simple song to sing apart from that chorus, which is a bit confusing. So we went through it pretty slowly as well. What we're going to do is try and speed it up a bit. The whole point of that chorus as well is for it to sound like bird song. I wrote the song around the chorus and thought that it sounded like bird song so I incorporated birds with it. And that's why it says singing. So the birds are singing 
Hendro harahu hi, hendro la la, hendro harahu hi, hendro hi, hendro harahu hi, hendro la la. So we'll try it at that quicker pace. We'll just do this with the very first section on the course. So we'll take it slow again, and then we'll speed it up. The blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush, they all met together to have a keely in the bush, singing hendro harahu hi, hendro la la. Hendro harahu, rui rui rui. Hendro harahu hi, hendro la la. Again, the blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush, they all met together to have a keely in the bush, singing hendro harahu hi, hendro la la. Hendro harahu, rui 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 rui. Hendro harahu hi, hendro la la. So I'll sing it at the speed that I want you to sing it, and then we'll sing it together at that speed. So, the blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush, they all met together to have a keely in the bush, singing hendro harahu hi hendro la la, hendro harahu rui rui rui, hendro harahu hi hendro la la. So sing that with me. The blackbird and the wren and the robin and the thrush, they all met together to have a keely in the bush, singing hendro harahu hi hendro la la, hendro harahu rui rui rui, hendro harahu hi hendro la la. So this is a great song for putting on your own wee things here and there. We talked last week about being able to put your own slant on and drain and down because there's so much room in it to play around with and I think although this is a fast song you can definitely play around with this song too. If you were wanted to sing it at a slower pace you can definitely play around with it but I think you can play around with it too whenever you're singing it at a faster pace. So sometimes I'll sing it that wee bit hip 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 like a bit of a not march but a jaunty slide on it um, and you can slow it down as well. That was a very quick um, tutorial because it's a very quick and easy song and I wrote it to be very quick and easy as a sort of quick fun song if children wanted to do it and it's a bit of a tongue twister here and there but it's still easy to learn and easy to sing although the thing that people might stumble on is the ru ru so I'd practice that a couple of times if, if you don't practice the rest of it I'd practice the chorus a couple of times just to get the hang of it and then you'll find yourself doing it at random intervals because I do I'll be driving along and I'll just be going Hendro harahu hi, hendro la la Hendro harahu ru ri ru ri Hendro harahu hi, hendro la la So I got this song, as I mentioned, from a Gaelic song and I heard it first from Marty Smith, I think and then I heard it on an album of Joan McKenzie singing it and it is called Hien de la Haruhi So I've changed it slightly to Hendro harahu hi, hendro la la, hendro harahu ruri ruri, where she'd sing it slightly differently. I changed it so that I'm able to sing it. So I often use um, different tunes whenever I'm writing songs. I find it very hard sometimes to write my own melodies because I've got so many different tunes in my head from other songs that even whenever I do write a song to a tune that's my own, I feel like there's another song out there that has that tune and that's just the burden of knowing a lot of different airs to different songs and you'll find that a lot in the tradition where one tune is used for multiple songs I'm thinking of the song Hills of Glen Swally that's a great song which Paddy Tunney sings his son John Tunney took the tune of that song and wrote his own song to it about his mother and I took that song and wrote another song to it and it's called Farewell to Sweet Room. Farewell unto you here in silence since I must go away. I'm leaving now my native country at the I'm going to far Cyprus day and those foreign lands to roam. I'll sing farewell to Anna Quinn, 
likewise I'll sweep the room. But that's just an example. That song follows the Hills of Glen Swilly. There's loads of different songs. I've written plenty of songs to tunes that already exist and loads of other people have written plenty of songs to tunes that already exist. That's the benefit of having these tunes as common uh, fare basically. Some people maybe don't know what came first, the tune or the song, or whether they came hand in hand, but for the most part they're common fare for everybody to use as they see fit. Traditional singers tend to be a bit more tr precious about the words of the song rather than the melody. That's why you'll probably find more singers kicking up about if you change the words to a song rather than if you change the melody. Sometimes you get an odd singer that'll come up and say that's a, that's a wrong tune to that or something like that. I've had it on more than one occasion where somebody's asked me where I got that version of that song and I have to turn around and say I've made it up and more than once the person's been a bit disappointed because they think that I'm going to give them some magical archive that they can go around and look at the songs but the archive's just in my head, I've just made it up that way. And I have no qualms about changing a song in the right way and it's hard to find, it's hard to describe what the right way is. Some people might take what I do sometimes as the wrong way but everybody's entitled to their own opinion. I don't think I've ever done anything that's blasphemous traditional singing. I've only done stuff that I've, I've wanted to hear. I've only sang songs that I've wanted to hear and I've only written songs that I've wanted to write. I want to use this song as a sort of jumping off point for another topic which I think is very important whenever it comes to traditional singing, which I find very important in my practice of traditional singing and in my practice of writing. And that is listening to other traditions and listening to cultures that aren't your native culture for inspiration and a broadening of your horizons, basically. Because if you isolate yourself to one thing and if you believe that your tradition is the be-all and end-all of traditions, then you're very much mistaken. All traditions stem from each other. All of them have a commonality in some way, shape or form. I'm always amazed at the common links that I find with different traditions, be that American traditions, because there's a lot of commonality between American Appalachian music and country music to an extent. A lot of the lovesick songs sort of stem from Scots Irish and Appala Appalachian music especially. Uh, then there's the reference of black American gospel music. Does that stem from Gaelic Sam singing? There's a debate over that, which is very interesting. And if, even if it doesn't, it's interesting to note that commonality between the two. And if you were to isolate yourself in one tradition and not know that there's that commonality between other traditions, then you're not appreciating the tradition in its wider aspects. So I'd very much encourage people to listen to songs in Irish and Gaelic if they want to learn more about Gaelic culture and if they want to broaden their horizons even more in terms of Gaelic culture they should listen to things like Galician music and music from Brittany, Breton music and Welsh music and old, probably old English uh, music as well. I'm thinking of the song The Agincourt Carol which is written in, I want to say style of writing that's a bit like Chaucer so it's recognisable you can sing it and you know what they're saying apart from the Latin choruses which is Deo gratia Deo gratia Anglia Rebe Provitoria so Agincourt Carol is a song which I find incredibly interesting. It's about the Battle of Agincourt, obviously, and the victory of the English over the French. It's from the 15th century. If you're interested in traditional music, if you're watching this, and you're willing to sing songs, and you're willing to listen to songs from the 15th century, from this tradition, you should be willing to listen to songs from the 15th century of other traditions. And if you're willing to listen to songs from the 15th century of other traditions, you should listen to songs of other traditions that aren't just from the 15th century, but 
from the 20th century, from the 19th century, you should broaden your horizons of all music. You should be aware of all music because all music informs what you're doing now. All current music stems from traditional singing. You do not get current music without traditional singing because current music is the evolution from traditional singing. I could break down a song by Ariana Grande and find common motifs in traditional songs from, I don't know, 15th, 16th century because there is that shared commonality even between modern music and traditional music going back hundreds of years. So it was commented about my album and Shanach do that it was hard to distinguish the original traditional songs from the songs which I had written. And I found that a very big compliment because that's what I was trying to do. And people will ask me how I write songs in that way so that they sound traditional. I do that through listening to traditions that are not just my own and through other sources, through reading older stories and things like that and becoming aware of the language. And then it's very easy to turn that language on. So I'm going to talk about three distinct traditions that I listen to and inform my practice. Because I feel like listening to songs outside your own tradition, you get to learn about and appreciate other cultures, as I've said, and you also learn more about your own culture. Three traditions or three cultures which inform my practice the most. Now I should say that other things inform my practice outside of these, but these are the three main ones. So they are the Irish language, tradition and culture, the Gaelic language, tradition and culture of Scotland, and the Greek language, tradition and culture, be it Repetika, Greek traditional singing culture, or the Café Aman, traditional singing culture, or be it reading through ancient Greek manuscripts and translations of ancient Greek manuscripts and things like that. So we'll start off with the Irish language tradition. This might seem a bit obvious, but it's not actually the biggest influence out of the three, but it's the closest influence for whenever I'm singing and writing. So a person who wants to inform their style on this island, even if they sing purely in English and they don't sing in Irish at all, needs to listen to singers and speakers of Irish. I don't listen to as many Irish language singers as I do listen to Gaelic language singers, but the most important one to me, apart from Joe Heaney, which we talked about last week, is probably Darach O'Chain. His ornamentation is perfect and very rooted in the tradition, very natural. There's no stinting whenever it comes to ornamentation. So I've linked him as a reference to watch as well. A song which is very influential for me in terms of the Irish singing culture is Cúrt and that's because the ornamentation in it, for me, is very reminiscent of other things outside of the Irish language tradition. So I'll play that here for you. I mentioned before that I'm really interested in sagas and older stories, etc. And I draw a lot of insp inspiration from them. And I mentioned the Tan Bukhunya. And a thing which I think about whenever I'm singing sometimes, less so whenever I'm singing, but more so whenever I'm writing in a sp specific format, it's a recording made for a documentary about the Iliad 
and the supposed writer of the Iliad, Homer. So if you're not familiar with that, Homer was said to be the author of the Iliad. It's more likely that the Iliad stemmed from an oral tradition of lots of different writers, different sections of different communities had their own versions of the story of the Iliad and they were put together under the name of this blind bardic poet called Homer. It was in this documentary that they looked at other cultures performing aspects of the oral tradition and they came to Ireland and they recorded a monolingual Irish speaker, a person who only spoke Irish, who did not have any English whatsoever. Now he might have had some English basically for the majority of his life he only spoke Irish and knew next to no English. So they recorded this man and they referenced him as being a reciter of old tales. They referenced him as being one of the last links to the properly old oral tradition of a person who could recite stories as long as the Iliad because there were professional storytellers who told nothing but epics and epics are extremely long forms of, of narrative poetry normally referencing legendary objects, persons or events. So you have things like Anton Bukhunya that would be a form of epic. Then you have the sagas of Iceland they would be a form of epic. Then you have the Iliad and the Odyssey, which are a form of epic, probably the most well-known forms of epic to all around cultures. Then you have the epic poem Beowulf, which is famously translated by Seamus Heaney. So those are examples of epic poetry. This man could still um, tell snatches of stories and I always think about it whenever I'm writing. Because the language that he uses is very familiar and I would say that the singing tradition was informed by the oral story town tradition because originally epic stories epic poems were told in the form of song so in ancient greece the poems written by homer if homer was a real person he would have sang the iliad in the same way that sappho sang her poetry other ancient greek poets would have sang to a harp or some other accompaniment so traditional singing definitely stems out of that culture of epic poetry. And that's why I use sources like that to inform my practice because I find the language very much similar. There's a quote from the documentary and I'll link the clip of him in the references. But there's a specific quote which I would like to share and it says, There are still storytellers reciting tales of heroic deeds in heroic language. They resemble Homer in their style of speech, especially in the formulas or runs whose repeat passages, like Homer's, are highly formalised. It's hard to explain what that formula is, but that's the formula that I draw on to write. I can find no way to actively describe what it is. You just have to look through it and see the commonality between the traditions to understand what that formula is. And once you do that, you're able to write in that formula. Now, there are things like, Bardic, like ancient Bardic poetry of Ireland, which you can describe what the formula is in terms of the way that they string the sentence together. The formula that I mean is the language used, not the way that it, the language is put together. So you might have an, a couple of internal rhymes, blank verse, couple of internal rhymes, blank verse, couple of internal rhymes, that way. That's just a guide of you need to have a rhyme here and a rhyme here. But there's so much freedom in that to arrange your words in a certain way. And it's that free word arrangement along with the words that they actually used that I draw on whenever I'm writing. I wouldn't consider Bird's Keeley to be a good example of that. A better example of that would be things like Vines on the Mountain. A better example again would be the song that I wrote called And All the Birds Their Praise Did Sing For Mine and Me. It's a very long title, but it follows that formula. So a link between the Irish and the Gaelic. Now moving on to the Gaelic would be And also the song I wrote to the tune of a Gaelic song called Which is the Black Bosom. So where it starts Mine started 
Ey ardık naskı oh hi oh hü Fekki mohri oh hü Eh ho eh ho hü ho ho fali hü Oh ho hi oh hü The thing that rhymes in the song is the chorus That's what pulls it together And then you can fit in blank verse wherever you want It fits the tune But doesn't have to fit language wise And then I added a bit some fantastical events So I put a wedding, a wedding in it So in Hollywood I saw my love. She told me this story, your match is made. I called for the priest, I called for wine. Colm Kill was there and the Kings of Ulster. So the language is very unusual. In fact, that Colm Kill is there and the, the Kings of Ulster. I used to see him as well in Hulishi at Eyang. There's a gap between me and Eyang, or there's a strait between me and Eyang. And the Gaelic version of that is I was inspired by that to write in the Robin Crins it sang in winter Whilst the farmer gathers tender, So that was the start of it, and I wanted to include those older forms. You'll notice things being in threes. There's a comedic song that Joe Heaney sings. It's about marrying a fat woman. And in it, there's wee glimpses of those older things, which I referenced in the song inspired by Hula Shiatramiya Siang. In the Joe Heaney song, they say, Patsy McCann, will you marry me daughter? Patsy McCann, this girl you will wear. Ten sovereigns bright and gold I will give you. A three-legged stool and a fine feather bed. If you read older bardic poetry, there's an obsession with this three-legged stool. Three-legged stool clad in silver, three-legged stool clad in gold. In the song that I wrote to Hulishi at I use that as inspiration. Oh, of thy wish do I allow you to walk on He the reason I hurry ho Well, the Carlian I be talking I give her gifts of golden amber silken gowns. A three like still of clad in silver, he drease the hurry ho. A paltry grey, I'd also give her, he So that a three-legged stool all clad in silver was brought to my mind by the Patsy McCann song which made me think of older bardic references and bardic poetry from the Irish tradition and then the tune of it was influenced by which is a Gaelic song. I play different things off each other. So the next thing that I'm going to talk about and which is just as close to my heart is songs in the Greek tradition. So I mentioned last week how the Greek singer Cecilia Ballou is just as much a Shando singer as a singer in the Gaeltacht in the outer west of Ireland. And she is one of the key Greek singers that I listen to. I also listen to other stuff but she is to me the standout singer of the Greek tradition. And she sings in a style called Repetika. I also listen to things from the Café Aman tradition, which is highly ornamented and stems from a hodgepodge of Greek 
Turkish, Syrian and different other things, very Middle Eastern sound, but highly influential whenever it comes to the ornamentation of the song. As I draw heavily from epic poetry and Irish and Gaelic culture, I draw heavily from the research that I've done in terms of the Iliad. I am obsessed with the Iliad. The Iliad is my favourite form of epic ever written and I can't explain why. I think it's to do with the imagery that it conjures up and the language that it uses but it is my favourite form of epic poetry. And so because of that I was very interested in the Greek tradition and singers like Satelia Blue. I used what I had learnt from the Iliad to write the song Vines on the Mountain. So where the other songs are very noticeably Gaelic in their melodies and performance, Vines Upon the Mountain is very different and has been noticed to be different. And you'll have to forgive the sound of the reed. <laughs> So that was the tune of the Vines on the Mountain, which I heard from a Repetica song. And I just listened to the Repetica song and I didn't look at the translation of the song. I just tried to figure out what was happening in that. So I then used that to inform... Dull grow the vines upon the mountain Dark wine it pours out like the fountain once in sunshine, once in moonlight, there beside the wheels Walked a figure wrapped in starlight, clutching at her steers So uh, that was heavily influenced by Greek Repetica singing and Greek Repetica bazooki uh, But it was also influenced by Irish Bardic culture as well, in forms of the language So it's very otherworldly and that's because of the language that I used in it and also because of the tune. So it's easy to be otherworldly whenever you're playing those Middle, Middle Eastern sort of chords which are so out of the norm for somebody from a Gaelic culture to play. <laughs> So it's those slides that really influence the way that I ornament it as well. I don't know a lot of Greek. I don't really sing much in Gaelic either. I just use the culture as a sort of inf information hub for writing in English. But sometimes I write, I sing in Greek not very well probably if a Greek singer listened to me. But I, I enjoy singing in Greek to experiment with ornamentation. So things like to Kaki. O hele ka ki pu foris e gosto horisme no me picres que me vas en na e jo fodrarisme no I did tom alone, tom alone. I did kiss the rato So things like that are very helpful to practice ornamentation of your singing in English. I find it very helpful. So that's probably why I do a lot of ornamentation because I listen to a lot of different traditions where ornamentation is key. It's great fun to sing Greek songs that have the runs in them, like the song Apocleros. Which Sana Apocleros Iritsos Tinja Kakugas en Itia Pere Plano Menos Distigis Menos Magriaptis manas mu stinangalia per plano menos distigis menos 
I like to sing that the way that I like to sing Lovely Annie, which we talked about in the previous one, because it takes me all the way from low to high and high to low, and I get to play around with the ornamentation in a different way than I would maybe in an Irish song. So I think that the Greek Repetico songs and the Cafe Man songs are very much worth having a look at. They're very different, but somehow to me they feel very similar. And if you wanted to broaden your horizons, which being the whole point of this lesson really, that you should broaden your horizons, it's not a bad place to start. Good uh, traditional musicians and musicians of any kind will always look to other traditions to inform their practices, basically to be well equipped so that they can make the best music possible, which is always good. If we take Greece again, we took their Greek bouzouki and made an Irish bouzouki out of it, which I was playing earlier. And if you look at, say, Andy Irvine, I believe he's fascinated by Bulgarian rhythms. Follow that lead and look at other cultures. I'm not going to go over the references really individually because I have a lot of stuff to show you on this vein to do the archive. I've put a wee cross section of Gaelic songs, Greek songs, English songs, Scots songs. I've also got that link for the monolingual air speaker. And, oh, there's also a Welsh song in there as well. So there really is a bit of a cross section of different cultures. Hopefully that will springboard you on to other things. So I'll bring it close to this section and then we'll go on to my archive section because I've got a lot to show you in that. So for this archive section I have, as I said, a lot to show you. And I'm following on the vein of things that inspire my practice. So I'm going to start with three basic things which tie in very well with traditional music and then go on to a massive, literally a whole heap of stuff that some people won't find ties in, it ties in for me and that's why I'm showing it to you and it might be of interest to other people. So this is a wee thing to start off with. This is a map that was given to me by Malcolm Scott and it is a map of Aaron Agus Alipa, uh, Colum Kills region basically. So I've pulled it out. It is a massive map of Alipa Agus Aaron so you have Ireland and Scotland and all the place names if you look at Scotland are in Gaelic and Halipa, Scots Gaelic and all the place names in Ireland are Athgeilge so in Irish very grateful because it's a great map to have very um, useful to see the different place names if I was writing or something like that sometimes I take inspiration from wee things like this the next one is this which is Popular Scottish songs, words and music in tonic sulfur notation. You might not think you know what tonic sulfur notation is, but most likely you do. And tonic sulfur notation is what is in the sound of music, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. So instead of using musical notes, the airs in this book are noted down in tonic sulfur notation. That's a great wee book. So I've noted down this song, John Anderson, My Joe, which is a great song. And you should look that up, there's a great recording of it on YouTube. So it's laid out, all your lyrics below, how to sing it is tonic sulfur notation. So tonic sulfur notation would have been taught in the school. It was found easier to teach and easier to learn, I think, than musical notation. That shows you that a lot of the population would have been able to read and understand tonic sulfur notation whenever we paperback books like this are published with tonic sulfur notations instead of musical notes. The next thing I have to show you is, is a very special wee book and it is this and it is Ossian's Poems by Macpherson, a wee pocket edition from the 1800s, an early edition. The writing is absolutely minuscule. It has a dissertation at the start of it and then it has the work itself. So if you're not familiar with this James McPherson was a Scottish author and he claimed to have found manuscripts in the Highlands relating to the poet Ossian. So Ossian is a sort of Englishy translation of the poet Oshin, who was the son of Finn McCool. So these were reported to be poems by him 
and it stems from the Homeric bardic tradition so he wanted something like that for Scotland and claimed that he found all of these uh, manuscripts in Scotland. Other people said they wanted to examine them to see if his translations were right and everything else and just to see them because they were obviously a very big cultural asset to the country but he could never produce them so it was eventually realised that he was telling lies and the ASEAN poems were just poems that he wrote himself. They're very flowery and high society translations trying to live up I think to Homeric details but it's an absolutely fantastic wee book. Very hard to get. I found this online and it was an absolute bargain for what it was for being an early edition and a wee pocket edition at that. So I snapped it up and it's a great wee possession to have. The next thing I have goes back to my photography days again. So this is a book called Drum by Crass Clement. He went into a small bar and this photo book essay is basically the photographs from that venture into the bar and they're very evocative of Ireland that's why it was one of my favourite books during the course and this is an errata edition so it's basically like a facsimile edition of what the book looked like so the book was actually here but they've reprinted it as a larger book so that's one of the layered spreads and he saw, whenever he was in this bar, this man basically got closer and closer to him and just kept taking his photograph. Great blur, nearly Henry Cartier-Bresson sort of technique, like a noir film of this blur of this figure with this still in focus. There's another photograph. But this is a great book to have and very important piece of photographic work and one which I pull down from time to time. I used to pull down all the time and it used to inform my photography practice quite a lot but now it informs my traditional sign practice in terms of the visual image reflected on the language. So that was a small bundle of relevant material to traditional singing. I talked about my obsession of the Iliad and I have an obsession of ancient Greek culture and things like that as well. So I've got a lot of books about everything but I've got a lot of books to do with ancient Greece and translations of ancient Greek stories and things like that. So I'm going to start off with my different versions of the Iliad, just show you them one at a time very quickly and then the versions of the Odyssey which I have and then the miscellaneous other things that I have. So this is the Homer translation by Robert Fitzgerald and it's the Everyman, Everyman's Library edition and I got it second hand I believe. And I also have the audiobook of it and I've highlighted different sections and things like that. But it's absolutely fantastic edition and definitely brilliant whenever it's paired with the audiobook because sometimes I listen through and read through different passages. The Robert Fitzgerald edition is very flown compared to other editions. It's very easily read as well for somebody who might find the topic a bit grueling of ancient Greek culture. So this was the first copy of the Iliad that I ever had. The next version of the Iliad that I got was this, the Iliad of Homer by Barbara Leone Picard, illustrated by Kittle Monroe. I get books sometimes for the illustrations because I love illustrations. If you find the Robert Fitzgerald translation very hard to go through, I would go for this edition because it's even easier to read because it's styled for children. Kittle Monroe did a lot of illustrations for these sorts of Oxford edition children's books. They're like deluxe editions, but I don't think they were. They were quite cheap at the time. There's one of the illustrations there. And then each chapter is headed by a black and white illustration. It's easy to get inspired by that sort of culture. Whenever the illustrations are like that. The next versions that I picked up were this Iliad by Alessandro Barico. Baricho. So I haven't really read through that version yet. I have read through this Logue's Homer war music and this is just a direct translation, oh well not direct translation, a free translation of a specific part of the Iliad and it's great because the language used in it's very modern and whenever I read this I realised that I could make write my own stuff as well so I rewrote book six of the Iliad which I don't have to hand this is a great book. I got the second hand as well in Belfast and Faber and Faber stuff's normally really good. That's what Seamus Heaney books are normally published through. The next one I have is the 
Harvard Blue Up Classic Library edition of the Iliad, which is books 1 to 12, and I use this whenever I was writing my translation of book 6 of the Iliad. It has the ancient Greek on one side and the English on the other. All Loeb classical editions are green for ancient or Attic Greek and red for Latin. All of the Loeb classical library books have either the Greek for the green books or the Latin for the red books on the left hand side and then an English translation on the right hand side. And this is the A.T. Murray translation and it's a great translation so you can see I was doing a lot of stuff there. Going over book one Never was trying to learn ancient Greek and still am trying to learn Attic Greek and a bit of modern Greek as well. But that's Loeb Classical Library editions are really fantastic. I would encourage people to have a look at them. Bit pricey, but you can find some cheaper stuff and second hand. And they're also great if you're learning Greek or Latin for the comparison with the English and the original language. Most places sell just the translations, they don't have the original. So it's great to have that original available. The next two things I have, I got in Belfast. I got them together and they were originally part of the Belfast Library. They were rebound, I believe, for the Belfast Library. First is this actually really easy to read edition of the Iliad by Reverend Alfred J. Church, which has very similar to the Leone Picard book with the Cabral Monroe illustrations has those illustrations as well, which are evocative of Greek vase scenes, ancient Greek vase scenes. And along with that I also got Homer and the Iliad, which I find very interesting. And I use it almost as a reference book because it's dissertations. And this was rebound for the Belfast Library as well. So it's by John Stuart Blackie. It's got a great uh, Belfast Library front this uh, book plate there. Another thing I found in a second hand bookshop was this The Iliad of Homer translated by the Earl of Derby. It's written in the epic poem sort of format where it goes on and on and on. A bit like the Robert Fitzgerald version. I've dipped in and out of this. Quite a good translation of it as well. I don't think I've ever come across a particularly bad translation. This is published by J.M. Dent and Sons. J.M. Dent and Sons editions are really great V pocket editions. I always love this and I really like the frontispieces of their work. You probably see them from time to time. So if you see a copy of the Iliad anywhere, I would pick it up and give it a read, no matter what edition it is. And if you like where it's going, get a couple more editions or send them to me because I love collecting editions of the Iliad. Following on from the Iliad, you go on to the Odyssey. I actually got this, I think, before the Iliad because I was watching a version of the Odyssey on TV. So I thought, I'm really into this. So we'll get a copy of the Odyssey. And this is just a Penguin Classics edition. And as you can see, it's very well read. And I've still got as many references and things like that inside the pages. I drew on Iliad and the Odyssey in ancient Greek culture for my dissertation. I was obsessed about it from an early point and this is actually a notation card to help me with my dissertation which says the idea of the connection between mythology and visuality is a strong one. Early mythology, the predated writing, was communicated in a purely oral tradition. When we think of the oral tradition we automatically jump to the tales of Homer, ancient stories of Odysseus and large wooden horses. But Greece is not the only country whose stories started out through vocalisation. The Scandinavians have their sagas of which they are rightly proud. We Irish have a similar tradition as well. Indeed, every early civilization began to relay their stories in this way. The link from sound to the mind's eye is one of the greatest intensity. Therefore, the visual imagery conjured is just as intense. So I wrote that as part of my dissertation. I can't remember if I put it in it. But it sounds alright. My dissertation was on the connection between language and landscape and how they have an effect on each other. And I use things like this to inform it then as I use language and landscape to inform my practice now. So I went on from that and got this wee Circe and Cyclops 
These are the wee ADP editions by Penguin Little Black Classics and they're just wee excerpts and they're great. I'll show you another one in a second in the miscellaneous section. The next thing I got is one of my prized possessions because it's fallen apart and very loved and very old. Maybe not very loved, well it's very loved by me. I don't think it was very loved by the people that had it in their possession before me. My other half got it for me because she knows I'm so interested and stuff like this. And it is a copy of the Odyssey written entirely in ancient Greek or Attic Greek. It's not all of the books but it's books 1 to 12. I can't remember how many books there is in the Odyssey but I think that's quite a few of them. And it was originally owned by the Belfast Royal Academy. At the back of it sometimes I buy books and there's wee notes in them. This is no different. Somebody was beginning to write a letter and it says 59 Rugby Avenue, Bangor, County Down, 1939. So the year of the Second World War. Then at the back of this as well is a copy of somebody's homework, scrap paper homework. And on the back of it, somebody was writing limericks, which are a bit dirty. There's also a copy of maps that the person must have been practicing. German one there, which says Germany slash Austria at the top of it. So a nice wee piece of 1939 history. Clearly not impressed by this person, whoever they were. Getting old books are great because of stuff like that. But getting old books are also great because of their contents with stuff like that. I'm going to fly through now. So we also have a companion copy of the Odyssey to the Iliad which I showed you earlier which also was illustrated by Kittle Munro in blue and white tones instead of the black and orange tones. also have a small pocket copy of the Odyssey and this is a translation by T.E. Lawrence who is better known as Lawrence of Arabia and I've read bits and pieces of it it is a prose translation of the book. From what I've read, is very, very good. So he's a very good writer as well as being Lawrence of Arabia. I also have this very fancy swanky edition from Southport Centre, Cambridge Local Examinations crest there. Nice spine on it as well and marble edges. And this was given as a prize to W. Dawson in the Latin Juniors, so he's given a book about ancient Greek poetry. It's a very swanky book as well to be getting, but really nice, unique edition. So, to finish up our miscellaneous pile, we've got Sappho, a wee Little Black Classics copy of Sappho. Really nice poems in it, along with poetry section in it about Troy. A Loa Classics copy of Timaeus, Critias, Clytophon, Menexenus and the Epistles. I've not read through that. I think I got it whenever I was very young. Then we have old school copies of the Apologia of Plato or the Apologia of Socrates I should say and the Martyrdom of Socrates with the Apologia and the Crito in it. These books are really fantastic and I wish I could find more of them because they were used in schools for people learning ancient Greek and there would have been Latin counterparts of them as well and I have a few Latin counterparts. They were used as a teaching aid so you have snippets of things like the Iliad and the Odyssey and the martyrdom of Socrates and this is alternated between English and then Greek. Your teacher would have maybe said I want you to translate this line into ancient Greek and I want you to translate this line into modern English. So where this one alternates between English and Greek this one is purely Greek. I've tried to find more of these and I can't find them. Next I have two copies of a very famous poem. So we have the Agamemnon of Aeschylus and this is an edition which I got along with the story of the Iliad and the book of dissertations about the Iliad and it's clearly very well thumbed because people have tried to tape it up as well. I also have the very very prized copy of the Agamemnon of Aeschylus so this is the Browning translation and if you don't know there's a film called the Browning version it centres around this book and you should watch it it's an absolutely fantastic film you can find it online to watch you can also find it to buy and keep and every so often I go back and watch it and it's an absolutely great film and this book makes me think of that film and that film makes me think of this book so yeah this is the Browning version of the Agamemnon of Aeschylus which is a play about Agamemnon by the Greek playwright Aeschylus. I also have the Trojan Women by the Greek playwright Euripides and this translation is by Gilbert Murray it's a really nice translation as well, really nice book to have, hand cut pages so you would have had to get out your letter opener and cut the pages as you went along. The Trojan Women of Euripides is a fantastic play and you can find that online as well, Brian Blessed I think 
you start another adaptation of it but it's a really really great play and very modern in its sensibilities and very emotional as well but a good insight into ancient Greek culture and about the women left behind by war. We have Sophocles, Aeas, Electra, Trachinian Maidens and Philoctetes. So Sophocles in English first, part two by Arthur S. Way. Handcut book as well. So these are the plays of Sophocles done into English first. I also have this wee dissertation pamphlet on Cicero by A.E. Douglas. Virgil's Aeneid, so this was a Roman afterthought of the Iliad and the Odyssey. So the Aeneid is about what happened after the Trojan War. So this is book one to six and it's like those other books. So there's Latin and you would have translated from Latin and then you have a vocabulary section as well. That Another wee pamphlet, school book version of the Aeneid. The illustrations in it as well to help you along. I have a wee pocket Oxford edition of Livingston's translation of the Peloponnesian War by the historian Thucydides, Horace. Really nice edition of that. So Horace was a poet and those are his poems. Uh, Minos of Crete by Sidney Keyes. This is a really great interpretation. So it's Minos of Crete plays and stories. Minos of Crete takes up the vast majority of it and then there's some other things by him in there but Minos of Crete is the main work picture of him there as well. I also have this massive book which is Age of Fable or Beauties of Mythology by Bullfinch and this is the be all and end all of classical stories if you wanted to have a look at stuff. Roman names instead of Greek names for gods but very very good stories in it and illustrations every so often and it will talk about Ulysses which is the Latin name for Odysseus. The true ancient Greek name is Odysseus the same way that the true ancient Greek name is Heracles instead of Hercules so a fantastic massive tome to draw on whenever I'm writing different things. And then I have this great wonder book which is the Greek Poetry for Everyman by F. L. Lucas. F. L. Lucas was a great fella because he went through just everything. All the ancient Greek poets, he's got a version of the Iliad in here, which rhymes. And he also has the Odyssey by Homer in here, which rhymes. So all of his poems rhyme, all of his translations rhyme, and the translations are very, very good. It's hard to write a translation of a work and still get it to rhyme but his translations are very very good and they rhyme and there's also copies and extracts of Sappho in this book who was an ancient Greek poet who's very well known for her poetry so I look at this sometimes for inspiration of language whenever I want to go into that zone of writing in a particular formula I will use things like this to help me along. So that is it. We've been through um, a whole house basically of books. Hopefully it wasn't too boring to look at all them books but I find it extremely fascinating and every single one of them has helped inform my practice in some way and they've informed my practice because I've been open to cultures that aren't native to my own. I'm fascinated by cultures that I'm not native to but I consider it world culture and open to everybody. So that brings an end to this third lesson. I'll see you next time. Thanks for sticking it out and we'll see you in lesson four. Once again thank you very much to Gasyard Villa for sponsoring this episode. I'm just looking around at all the books now that I have to put back into their hiding places.